Glory Cloud Podcast, episode 36. Stay tuned, everyone. We've got an exciting episode this week. Welcome back to the Glory Cloud Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cahey, and I'm joined by our co-host, Charles Lee Irons. Welcome back, Lee. Hello, Chris. It's great to be with you again. Okay. We have got uh, an exciting episode this week about um, a figure and his work from historical theology. But before we dive right into that, I'll just do the regular housekeeping by reminding our listeners that we do have show notes over at meredithkline.com slash podcast. Um, we appreciate the five-star ratings on iTunes that we continue to receive. Thank you very much for that. And we even continue to get, uh, some donations, which we very, very much appreciate. Thank you so much for those. Uh, you can find the donate button at meredithkline.com slash podcast on the right-hand side of the screen. And before we, uh, actually dive right in, uh, Lee has an announcement about a conference that he will be speaking at that you won't want to miss. Yeah, I just wanted to let listeners know that I'll be speaking at a conference on May 5th through the 7th, 2017. It's a conference sponsored by Covenant United Reformed Church, where uh, Pastor David Inks uh, serves as the pastor. Uh, it's uh, in Clovis, California, which is not that far from Fresno. And the topic of the conference is, Is the Trinity Biblical? 21st Century Challenges to Historic Orthodoxy. And so the topic is not directly related to anything uh, related to Klein, per se, but it is going to be uh, sort of a, an apologetic uh, opportunity to, to study the doctrine of the Trinity, to see how it developed in church history, and to, to ask uh, whether the doctrine is in fact biblical or was it just something that, you know, the early church came up with, you know, the bishops at the Council of Nicaea, were they forced into this because of the Emperor Constantine? There's certain arguments that are out there like that. And so I'm going to try to deal with some of those things. And uh, also to answer some of the Unitarian arguments that are out there against the Trinity. So if you're within driving distance of Fresno, California, and you have a free weekend coming up, I'd love to, to see you and uh, be a great opportunity to fellowship and to uh, study theology. That'd be great. Okay, so it's in Fresno, and there is um, a website with more mm-hmm. information about the conference? Yes, we'll include the link to that on the show notes. Okay, very good. Uh, this week, we are going to be talking about... Um, the topic of the law in the hand of Christ. Um, so we've we've just finished going through Klein's book, The Structure of Biblical Authority. Um, Klein uh, talked about the fact that the Old Testament is inspired uh, scripture, but that the Old Testament is not the constitution for the new covenant. Um, to some, that might sound radical, but... The, the fact is that Klein's views actually do have uh, precedent within the Reformed tradition, and we can definitely hear uh, some uh, anticipations of Klein in the work of one Edward Fisher from the 17th century and his book, The Marrow of Modern Divinity. Um, Lee, do you want to tell us more about this idea of the law in the hand of Christ from that particular book? Yeah, sure. So Edward Fisher wrote this book called The Marrow of Modern Divinity, and it's broken up into two parts. Part one is a treatise on the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. And then part two is an exposition of the Ten Commandments. Um, in the uh, This book was published originally in, in 1645, um, under the name EF, and so there was some debate, has been some scholarly debate about who EF was, but most scholars seem to agree now that it was 
Edward Fisher. Uh, and in this book, um, Edward Fisher has a lot of things to say. There, there are a lot of issues that he's dealing with related to covenant theology, uh, the free offer of the gospel, the doctrine of sanctification. But there's one passage in here, and, and actually one whole section, uh, after dealing with the law of works and the law of faith, then he deals with the law of Christ. And in the section on the law of Christ, Edward Fisher makes this um, statement about how believers are to receive the Ten Commandments, uh, not from the hand of God out of Christ, nor yet at the hands of Moses, but only at the hands of Christ. And then he says, in this way, we are able to receive the moral law as the law of Christ. And so that phrase that, or that formulation of receiving the law uh, from the hand or the hands of Christ, uh, which is first attested here in this book, uh, seems to have uh, become something of a commonplace uh, among a certain stream of Reformed theology uh, since, since that time. Um, a very, very Scottish stream, right? That's right. Yeah, so it was picked up. Uh, Edward Fisher's work was picked up by Thomas Boston. He discovered it in the year 1700 in the window of a parishioner. And then he mentioned it to uh, one of his minister friends named James Hogg. And James Hogg republished the book in 1718. And that's what sparked uh, what's called the Marrow Controversy because the Church of Scotland at the time was uh, under sort of a legalistic, moralistic spell. And the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland condemned the book because they thought it was not only antinomian, but that it also seemed to imply, it didn't actually teach uh, universal atonement, but it seemed to imply something close to that because of its emphasis on the free offer of the gospel. And so the General Assembly condemned the book, and that created a reaction where certain men like Thomas Boston, uh, his friend James Hogg, uh, the Erskine brothers, Ralph and Ebenezer, and a number of other ministers in the Church of Scotland at the time, who later became known as the Marrow Men because of their defense of this book. Uh, in 1721, they responded to the condemnation of the General Assembly of 1720 and wrote a thing called a representation and petition in which they defended the book and they went through each of the points where the General Assembly had questioned the book. And so from that point on, it seems that this particular phrase of the law in the hand of Christ seems to have been cherished by those that follow in that marrow tradition, which turns out to be basically the secession uh, the, the, the seceders that came out of the Church of Scotland and, uh, you know, those like the Erskine brothers and so on. And they uh, continued that tradition and made it, um, made it more popular in their writings. Okay. Uh, so we can link to some, some good treatments of that whole Marrow controversy. We don't really have time to uh, unpack all of that in this episode, but... Um, there's plenty of good material out there. And um, let's see, we can uh, maybe get a running start at uh, Edward Fisher himself um, by, let's see, the, the, there really is not a lot of biographical material available about him. But um, even though... I don't wholly endorse uh, David Como's theology. I do think he is a fine historian, uh, and so does Stanford University. But he has written a book called Blown by the Spirit that deals with um, the antinomian controversies that were raging in uh, early modern England. And he talks about Edward Fisher in that book and uh, gives a, a brief recounting of a situation where a man named Giles Creech was hauled before the court of high commission, which was uh, a very heavy handed court in early modern England. They were charged with um, dealing with uh, theological error and um, uh, errors in uh, the church of England. And 
they were threatening to punish Giles Creech severely for his uh, theological infractions. And in exchange for a lesser punishment, he agreed to give them names of other people who were equally guilty in, in his mind. And Edward Fisher was one of the names that he gave them. And he said that Edward was responsible for um, basically passing antinomian books, uh, buying them and then, and then selling them underground in England. So anyway, that's kind of an, an interesting uh, historical tidbit about Edward Fisher. Don't be alarmed by that. It was very common for uh, Puritans to accuse each other of being antinomian. Mm-hmm. But um, anything else you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, it might be helpful for our listeners to get a hold of Sinclair Ferguson's recent book, The Whole Christ. Yes. Because he has a chapter in there in, in the beginning where he traces the history of uh, the Merrow controversy. So he's looking not at the time of Edward Fisher in the 1640s, but jumping forward to the early 1700s where you have um, the, the General Assembly condemning the book and so on and the, the Merrow controversy that was raging during that time. But he has a good... Uh, historical summary of what went on then. He also mentions that on this issue of who was EF, and he says, Ferguson says that the author's identity has been disputed, but the consensus view is that he was Edward Fisher, a barber surgeon in London. So I'm not sure what a barber surgeon is, presumably <laughs> a surgeon who also has a barber shop or maybe a barber who has a does some surgical work in the back. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, sounds like he was, you know, not he was not a professor of theology. He was not a pastor. But at the same time, he was not some sort of illiterate, you know, ignoramus either. And in fact, I discovered in uh, the 1789 edition of the Marrow uh, that uh, he was. This was an advertisement put at the beginning and. The publisher wanted to give some information about who was this guy, Edward Fisher, and he said that he was noted for his great learning in Greek, Hebrew, and patristics, and that he had a bachelor's degree from Brazenose College, Oxford. So wow. he was he was an educated fellow, and you can tell, too, when you read the book, because he's always quoting all kinds of Reformed theologians and authors, and he's, he's a pretty, you know, astute theological writer. Yes, um, and I would encourage our listeners to actually, uh, if they can, get a copy of The Marrow of Modern Divinity. And when you read it, you'll realize, um, you know, this is no dummy. He right. He does know what he's doing theologically. Um, I, I've actually done some work on Fisher myself, and uh, I remember reading, um, I still don't understand how it works, but yeah, um, barber surgeons did... Uh, perform both duties together. Uh, they would cut hair and uh, cut your body for the purposes of <laughs> surgery and healing and things like that. Um, <laughs> I've got these handy uh, shears here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this blade will shave your face. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> um, and also, I, I ran across another uh, good um, survey of the whole marrow controversy by. Um, a gentleman, I hope I pronounce his name correctly, but it's William Van Dudevard, Van Dudevard, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, the Marrow Controversy and Seceder Tradition. Uh, he's got some very helpful uh, historical o- overview and work on the Marrow Controversy there. Yeah, I've seen that book as well. That looks really good. And he also has an article in the Westminster Theological Journal that gives a summary. Okay. So we'll, we'll link to as much as we possibly can. Yeah. And also we should note that, uh, that this book, The Marrow of Modern Divinity, it's been republished many times. But in 1726, so a few years after you know, the Marrow controversy erupted, Thomas Boston uh, took the book and then he uh, went through and made – extensive, sometimes very lengthy footnotes uh, explaining and expounding certain passages and clarifying certain issues in the book. 
And so that is the edition that most uh, of us are familiar with. If you look at modern reprints, uh, you'll find like there's one by Christian Focus, there's one by Stillwater's Revival. Uh, you'll see that they usually publish um, the edition with Thomas Boston's notes. And those are also very helpful. And I recommend that you, the readers and, and, hear, and listeners, check those out as well. Absolutely. They're, they're helpful notes and they're very insightful as to uh, the kind of impact that the book was having in uh, early 18th century Scotland. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, it was, like you said, published in 1645 and yet it really uh, went under the theological radar for, for the rest of the 17th century. Mm -hmm. We really don't hear about it until Boston discovered it and began to circulate it among other Scottish uh, Presbyterian ministers. Right. Yeah, if it hadn't been for Boston's uh, rediscovery of it, we probably never would have heard of it. Right. It would have just been another book that was written by some Puritan and, you know, some pamphlet or some book that just got lost in the mist of time. But uh, because of Thomas Boston's rediscovery and then the republishing of it, uh, that kind of gave it a new lease in life. And uh, it has made quite an impact since then. But so. the main thing that we want to do is to, to try to focus on uh, this whole concept of the law in the hand of Christ that is articulated in this book. And again, that's only one of the things that this book is dealing with. There are other issues and theological uh, topics, but this one particular concept that believers are to receive the law uh, not from God out of Christ, but from God in Christ, from the mediator, uh, this is a very helpful way of understanding the third use of the law. And there are four points that I want to bring out that help to provide sort of the context for this. So the first point is that there's an assumption here that the moral law comes in different covenant forms. Mm. And the two main forms that it comes in are the law of works and the law of Christ. So, for example, Edward Fisher, by the way, this book is written as a dialogue. Right. And you have uh, four, four people in the dialogue. You have Evangelista, who is a good guy. He's a minister of the gospel, and he basically represents... Edward Fisher's viewpoint. You have Nomista, a legalist. You have Antinomista, obviously an antinomian. And then you have Neophytus, who's a young Christian who's listening to the different viewpoints and trying to decide uh, where he stands. And uh, at one point when um, Evangelista is talking to Neophytus, uh, there's a, a discussion and um, he, Evangelista is trying to convince Neophytus to understand this distinction between the law of works and the law of Christ. And Edward Fisher has Neophytus say, I conceive, basically he's coming to understand from Evangelista that though the law of Christ in regard of the substance and matter be all one with the law of works, yet their forms do differ. And, and that's really the essence of what Edward Fisher is trying to argue is that the law comes in different covenant forms the law of works, and the law of Christ. And what is the difference? Well, it's pretty obvious, right? One is a covenant of works, and the other is a covenant of grace. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at Ralph Erskine, he uh, is expounding this idea in a little bit more detail in his later writings. Ralph Erskine talks about the, uh, the legal form of the moral law versus the gospel form of the moral law. He says, quote, the command of the law of works is do and live, but in the hand of Christ, it is live and do. Completely inverted. Yeah. And so basically what, what uh, Edward Fisher and the Merrow men after him are saying is that the law of Christ, or another way of putting that is the law as a rule in the hand of Christ, it's basically nothing other than the imperatives that you find throughout the New Testament especially in the epistles. And the way those imperatives are grounded in the indicatives of our identity in Christ, that we are, we have died 
with Christ, we've been raised with Christ, and therefore because those things are true, here are the imperatives that flow from that so that we should be who we are in Christ. You know, just think of, um, you know, all those those great sections in Paul's letters where he um, makes that transition to the, the paranetic sections, that is the, the sections where he's giving the exhortations to live the Christian life. Just think of, you know, Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. And he's referring there to all the mercies of God that he's been describing in the first 11 chapters, right? Mm. By the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Or Ephesians 4, verse 1, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Or Colossians 3, verse 1, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died. And so the imperatives are grounded in the indicatives. They're the outflow of the indicative. So what the Merrill men are saying is, is that that's the law of Christ. Right. Yeah, they're, uh, and back to Erskine's point, these imperatives that are grounded in uh, the indicatives of the gospel are not coming to us as threats. Right. You know, it, if you don't do this, God's really going to get you. No, that's, uh, that's completely foreign to the law as Christ delivers it to us. Right. Yeah. And um, I love the way uh, Ralph Erskine puts it. Um, the Merrill men really grabbed a hold of this, you know, this concept uh, from Edward Fisher, and they just really fleshed it out and expounded it. And they said, uh, for example, this is Ralph Erskine, he says um, that every part of it, that is the law of Christ, now constrains the believer to obedience and sanctification in a most loving manner. The gospel law or the law of grace that now he is under is a chariot paved with love. Mm. He says that the commands of the law in the hand of Christ have lost their old covenant form and are full of love. The command of the law of works is do and live, but in the hand of Christ it is live and do. The command of the law of works is do or else be damned, but in the but the law in the hand of Christ is I have delivered thee from hell, therefore do. The command of the law of works is do in thine own strength, but the law in the hand of Christ is I am thy strength. My strength shall be perfected in thy weakness therefore do. Hmm. The command is materially the same, but the form is different. And so I just love how these pastors, they, they, they really draw out the implications of this and they communicate it to their, to their flock in a way that is so encouraging and has such a, a power to it to almost compel you to want to obey. Exactly. You know? Instead of it being this grievous, heavy burden where you're under these threats of curse and condemnation, it, it, it causes you to delight in God's law. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, uh, I mean, just hearing the way he puts it when he goes to the hand of Christ yeah. just creates gratitude in your heart, or at least right. mine as I hear it. Whereas <laughs> when he talks about the law of works, it's... Um, you know, I just immediately think of uh, what a failure I am already and how there's no way I'm going to live up to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. so that's the first major theological premise here is that the law comes in different covenant forms. The second major premise of this is that uh, there's this whole idea of republication standing behind it, right? Right, right. We've already touched on it, but... Uh, you know, the idea that the Mosaic law is in some way a republication of the Adamic covenant of works is strongly implied by all of these statements. Not only Edward Fisher, he explicitly says that, but also the other Merrow men. Um, actually, it's interesting to look at some of the the ways that these guys dealt with this issue. They all agreed that the Mosaic law is in some sense a republication of of the Adamic covenant of works or that it contains a works principle, but they had different formulations of that. Um, Edward Fisher himself, and then another uh, theologian who was his contemporary, Samuel Bolton, who also seems to have been aware of Edward Fisher's work. Uh, those two guys both held to what's called the subservient covenant view. 
Right. Which, in my view, is closest to Klein's typological view. Uh, maybe we could link to the episode where we, uh, I think it was when we discussed the OPC report. Yeah, right? exactly. And we yeah. talked about the subservient covenant view. Right. And and that's the idea that, uh, that the covenant that works with Israel was a national covenant having to do with blessings in the land of Canaan. And so, and it was given as a subservient covenant in order to prepare the way for Christ. So to, to show Israel their inability and to be a pedagogue uh, to lead them to Christ. Uh, but Thomas Boston, in his footnotes to the Marrow, uh, he has a long footnote. Uh, this is early on in the Marrow, um, where he says that he he sort of agrees with with uh, Edward Fisher, but he has a slightly different take on it. And he says that he holds that both the Covenant of Works and the Covenant of Grace were republished side by side at Mount Sinai. Hmm. And that's an interesting formulation. Yeah. <laughs> because he's not seeing them as uh, the same covenant. Right. So so he, he, he appeals to all the evidence that there's a covenant of grace there because you have the preface to the Ten Commandments, I'm the Lord your God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt. You know, you have the the fact that it's, that the redemption of, of Israel out of Egypt is in fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and so on. But then he says, but I can't deny, he says, I cannot refuse uh, that there's also the covenant of works here, you know, and then he quotes Paul's quote, you know, Paul's statements, especially right. Galatians 4.24. These are two covenants, mm. one from Mount Sinai, which genders to bondage and so on. He quotes, you know, Romans 10.5, the where Paul quotes Leviticus 18.5 and so on. And so he says, therefore I conceive the two covenants to have been both delivered on Mount Sinai to the Israelites. Interesting. So he didn't agree exactly with uh, Edward Fisher on his way of formulating the concept of republication, but he still held to some version of it, <laughs> right. some version of republication. And however you get there, you have to have that. Otherwise, you can't say that, you know, going back to our first premise, then you, you can't get this idea that the law of works and the law of Christ are two diametrically opposed forms of the moral law. Sure. I mean, why would, why would it need to come in different forms if it's all just one covenant of grace anyway? Right. So. So the third... Uh, theological premise is that this marrow tradition going back to Edward Fisher is very strongly emphasizing something that is taught by Paul and that is that believers have died to the law as a covenant of works right because of our union with Christ through his death we have died to the law and you know I'm just thinking of Places where Paul says that explicitly, you know, Romans 7, 4, he says, likewise, my brothers, after giving the analogy of um, the marriage analogy, he says, likewise, my brothers, you also, like the woman in the analogy, have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. And then Galatians two nineteen and 20, through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. And the thing that's so important about what these guys are seeing, what you know, Fisher and Boston and the Merrowman are seeing is, is that they're recognizing that when Paul uses the word law in those verses, you know, the word namos in Greek, mm -hmm. uh, they're understanding that Paul cannot mean the eternal moral law. Exactly. Because if, if that's what Paul means, that we've died to the eternal moral law, then that would be antinomianism. Yeah, Paul would be an antinomian. Yeah. What they grasp is that for Paul, the law, the namas there, is the Mosaic law as a covenant of works. Once you get that, once you get that basic, it's a very important lexical point, you know? Mm -hmm. Once you get that point, then it's clear what Paul is saying. And then it becomes theologically significant, and it's not antinomian, but it's a very precious truth.
Uh, for example, John Gill, so he was a particular Baptist in the 18th century, but he was also influenced by this marrow tradition. He said, when the law is in a sense said to become dead and believers in Christ dead to that and delivered from it, this must be understood of it as a covenant of works. That's right. a very clear statement of the issue here. And the thing that I think is so interesting is that even the Westminster divines recognize this. Because if you look at their larger catechism, in question 97, they say that uh, believers, uh, or they that are regenerate and believe in Christ, are delivered from the moral law as a covenant of works, so as thereby they are neither justified nor condemned. Okay, so they obviously recognize the need to to formulate that right that uh if we're not free from the moral law as a covenant of works then um we we have no assurance of our salvation we have no encouragement in living the christian life Mm -hmm. so if we're not delivered from the moral law as a covenant of works then we are on the hook to be justified on the basis of our obedience. That's right. And we will be condemned if we break even one commandment. And so therefore we're all, we're all doomed if we're, if we're still under the law as a covenant of works. Exactly. And the Marrow men seem to really understand that so clearly. Yeah. And so following the logic then, uh, the law comes in different covenant forms. There's this idea of republication. There's the Pauline teaching that we've died to the law as a covenant of works. Then that brings you to the fourth point, which is the law of Christ. So we're not free from the moral law. We haven't died to the moral law. We've died to the moral law in that covenant form as a covenant of works. And so now we are bound to the moral law as delivered to us by Christ. And so they refer to this as the law of Christ. Again, quoting Paul. Uh, Paul uses that phrase uh, explicitly. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And again, in 1 Corinthians 9, 21, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. And in Greek, it's a little bit of a different phrase there. It's not literally the law of Christ. It's en namas Christu. So under the law of, to Christ, in law to Christ. It's another way of putting it. Oh, interesting. But the concept is the same. So that's the theological context of, those are the four main points that provide sort of a structure to make sense of this uh, this key theological concept of the law in the hand of Christ. So, can can we talk for a minute more about this idea of the law of Christ? Mm-hmm. Is the idea essentially that our Savior is not in a Jekyll and Hyde situation and that if he is our Savior and he loves us and has laid down his life for us, his that disposition on his part toward us doesn't change Uh, when he delivers the law to us. Mm -hmm. He's still our loving, sacrificial savior. That's right. Okay. The law of Christ is the law of love. Okay. You know, Paul says that if, that love is the fulfilling of the law and what is love, it's, it's what Christ has revealed to us in his, like you said, his attitude and disposition to us and laying down his life for us. Which again is that whole indicative and imperative um, relationship where we get uh, in more than one place in the New Testament, love one another just as I have loved you. Right. So we're to look at how Christ has loved us to see what that ought to look like for how we love each other. Mm -hmm. And Jesus even calls it a new commandment. Right. So again, that, that would be sort of a Johannine parallel to the Pauline phrase, the law of Christ. Okay. I hadn't made that connection before, but that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. So, um, obviously in, in history, uh, as Edward Fisher wrote the marrow and as, 
Thomas Boston and others uh, picked the marrow back up and dusted it off and began to write more about it. Uh, this raised questions about antinomianism. Yeah, the old bugbear of antinomianism. <laughs> people are very concerned about that, and it's understandable. You know, people are worried that are you are you saying that somehow, you know, there's some sort of um, that this new law of Christ is somehow, you know, taking away the authority of the, of God in his law or something? Is it somehow reducing the authoritative commanding nature of God's holy law? Uh, that's one concern. Another concern is, are you saying that there's some change in the actual content of the moral law? Hmm. So these are two fears or worries or maybe even accusations <laughs> on the part of of those that don't like this formulation. And these were two worries and maybe even accusations that were leveled at that time, whether it was Edward Fisher, you mentioned that he was, you know, accused of trading in antinomian literature, or whether it was the Merrill men who were accused of antinomianism later. Mm -hmm. And I think that the answer to both of those worries or accusations is that, uh, no to both. So as far as the first one, is there any, lessening of the divine authority or diminution of the authority of God in the law? And the answer has to be no, because, you know, just think about it theologically, Christ is the divine son of God. And so when he communicates his will to his people, it comes from the authority of God himself. Right. The law of Christ is the law of God because he is God. So it has the same divine authority and in fact, I think we could argue that the authority of the moral law is actually strengthened hmm. in this way, when the law comes to us from the hand of Christ, because the gospel strengthens that bond. That's right. Um, strengthens it in the sense that um, now we have um, a, a, new, a new energy to obey it with? Is that what you Yeah, mean? I mean, it's like we not only have the bond of we're obligated to obey God because of creation. God is the creator and so he's the authority over us. We're his creatures. So we have to obey him. Right. But now we have the bond of redemption. We've mm. been bought with a price. And so we're not our own and we must glorify God in our bodies. You know, to quote Paul from 1 Corinthians 6. So there's that the gospel adds another even more powerful bond because this is the bond of not simply God, the creator, but God who became man and redeemed us and now owns us even, you know, he owns us twice <laughs> almost, you know, he, right. his authority over us is, is now the authority of redeeming love. Right. And yeah, uh, I was just thinking as you were saying that of what we talked about in a, a few episodes back about God being or Christ being like uh, Hosea in that he has mm. married us even in our, mm -hmm. our filth and our unfaithfulness. Mm -hmm. um, how, how can you uh, know that and not want to uh, thank him in some way? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just think of, you know, Second Corinthians five: the love of Christ constrains us. Right. And I think again, you know, the Westminster divines. Uh, I quoted the larger Catechism, but also in the Confession, in their chapter on the law, they say this: uh, Chapter nineteen, paragraph five. They say the moral law doth forever bind all as well justified persons as others to the obedience thereof, and that not only in regard of the matter contained in it, but also in respect of the authority of God, the creator who gave it. Neither doth Christ in the gospel any way dissolve, but much strengthen this obligation. There you go. That last phrase, the last sentence, that Christ in the gospel strengthens the obligation that we already, uh, that's already established because of the authority of God, the creator. Okay. So there's no diminution of the divine authority of the law. Ralph Erskine also makes that same argument about Christ being divine. He says, the authority of the commanding God 
is not lessened or lost now that the command is in the hand of Christ. Christ is God, co-equal and co-essential with the Father. It is not lessened, but sweetened and made amiable, lovely, and desirable to the believer. Hmm. Okay, so that that should at least answer the the skeptics' concern about um, whether whether we're attacking the authority of God's law. Mm-hmm. No, it has the same authority. In fact, that authority is probably only heightened because mm-hmm. it comes in the hand of Christ. Right. Okay. But then there's the other concern that there might we might be saying that there's a change in the content of the moral law. Right. So um, the answer to this one is also no. There's no change because uh, just think about it logically. What is the moral law? Well, it's it is the obligation to obey God and to uh, follow God's holiness and justice and goodness and truth. It's rooted in the fact that God himself is holy and just and good and that we are made in the image of God. And so the moral law is by definition unchangeable. Right. You, you this, just talked about the image of God. I mean, it's a necessary implication of, of being made in his image. Right. It doesn't matter what epic of redemptive history you're in, whether it's before the fall or after, whether it's the old covenant or the new, the moral law doesn't change. Because God doesn't change. Because God doesn't change. Yep. And so I think that that might be why Edward Fisher, so he wrote, you know, the the first book was that dialogue um, and, you know, is focused on the issue of the covenant of works and the covenant of grace, the law of works and the law of faith, the law of Christ and so on. But then in 1648, he reissued the book with an addendum and it was an exposition of the Ten Commandments. And I think he wanted to sort of set at rest this idea that somehow he's saying that the law of Christ is somehow implying some kind of a change in the content of the moral law. And he's saying, no, it's the same content. It's just that the motivation is different. The covenantal context is different. Okay. And, And Ralph Erskine said, I already quoted this, but he said, the command is materially the same, but the form is different. The covenant form. Instead of do this and live, it's live and and do this in response to God's grace. Now, there is one uh, point that we have to bring up here, and that is we're we're using this whole idea of the law in the hand of Christ uh, as precedent for Klein's thinking on this issue of the law. But there's one thing that Klein would want to say that probably these uh, 16th and 17th century authors did not clearly say. And that is Klein would want to add a little proviso and just say, look, the Decalogue contains the moral law, but it's not identical to the moral law. So all the stuff that we've been saying about the moral law cannot change is true. But don't equate that with the Decalogue per se, because the Decalogue is the moral law but in the form given to Israel as a nation, and therefore it has some theocratic garments and clothing attached to it uh, that is adapted to Israel's specific circumstances in the land and at that particular point in redemptive history. That's a helpful way of putting it. Um, but yeah, the, there are things that we can see in the Ten Commandments that were unique to Israel's situation. Right. So they couldn't possibly be uh, eternal in that, in that way. Right. Right. Like the, the, the blessing attached to the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land that the Lord, your God has given you. Right. So that's clearly theocratic. It's only for Israel. There's no promise for us today that, that, that will, that we have that. So, we have to just be careful there and not identify the Decalogue with the moral law. Okay. Nevertheless, we can see that the Decalogue contains the moral law. Sure. And I mean, you find New Testament authors um, drawing on 
the substance of the Decalogue quite frequently. Yeah, I mean, most of the Ten Commandments, not all, but most of them are quoted in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why then is uh, Fisher's and the Marrow Men's formulation of the law in the hand of Christ so helpful? Why, why are we talking about this on a podcast about Meredith Klein? I think it's helpful because uh, it gives us, you know, as we were going through those four points, especially the, the second or especially the third and the fourth, the one about we've died to the law mm -hmm. and the law of Christ, um, those statements are directly from Paul. And I think that, that the marrow tradition of understanding the third use of the law in this way instead of just talking about the third use of the law as the third use of the Decalogue by itself, but right. the third use of the law in the sense of the law as delivered to us from the hand of Christ is very helpful because it provides us with a more authentically Pauline way of talking and speaking and preaching and communicating to God's people. It's, it's a more biblical idiom, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it helps us to capture both of... Paul's statements. Paul has, you know, you could go through all of Paul's statements on the law and you could, uh, and this is sort of a typical thing that Pauline scholars do when they are dealing with the issue of Paul's view of the law, and they'll just make a list and say, here's all the negative statements that Paul makes about the law. You know, we've died to the law, we're not under the law, um, the law was a pedagogue, it was temporary, you know, all those negative statements, and then you can have all the positive statements in this other column over here, and you have the law is holy and righteous and good, and you have, you know, the fact that the righteous requirements of the law are being fulfilled in us as we walk in the Spirit, and, you know, the love is the fulfilling of the law, et cetera, et cetera, and even where he quotes the law, like, you know, in Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4, he quotes the fifth commandment. Right. So, you have all the negative statements and all the positive statements, and how do you resolve these? How do you bring those together? Well, I think that that this marrow approach provides us with the best way of being able to capture both of those things. Hmm. You see the negative statements, right? We've died to the law. We're not under the law as a covenant of works. That all makes sense now. But you also see the positive. You see that, yes, the, the law is holy and righteous and good. Yes, the law does have these righteous requirements that are being fulfilled in us as we walk in the Spirit. And that's the law of Christ. And so I think that that's the first real benefit of this formulation is that it helps us to be able to make sense of Paul and to talk like Paul and to preach like Paul. <laughs> hmm. You know, there's something wrong with our theology if it just sounds different from Paul. Right. Or, yeah, if we're, you know, itching to condemn Paul because he puts something a certain way. Or having to try to always explain it away. <laughs> right. you know? Yeah. He didn't really mean that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, as you were saying that, it struck me in a, in a way that maybe I haven't thought about it before, but so obviously died to the law in the sense of, uh, the covenant of works. Yeah, I get, but then contrasting that with Paul's positive statements, almost taking the law as, um, the image of God, which he is, um, working into us as he conforms us to the image of Christ. That's right. So. Yeah. I mean, he explicitly uses that language. Right. Of the image of God being restored. You know, he uses that in second Corinthians three, uh, and also in, um, in Colossians chapter three, where he says that, um, Colossians three, nine, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man, with its practices and to put on the new man, which of course I think old man, new man, that's old Adam, new Adam, right? Right. So Christ is the, is the new man. He's the second Adam, the new man, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Mm. And it's interesting that that comes after Colossians two, where he talks about what Christ did relative to the law mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in his work on the cross there that would clearly be a reference to the law as a covenant of works. Right. 
yeah, if you just go back to Colossians 2, in that great verse, verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in the cross. By, I skip verse 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So there's the laws of covenant of works being nailed to the cross and taken away. And then you turn to chapter three and you have being renewed in the image of God. Right. And there's no less a sense of freedom in chapter three than there is in chapter two. Right. I mean, you hear what Paul's saying in chapter two and you breathe this sigh of relief that if, if Christ killed what could condemn me, uh, I can breathe a sigh of relief. And that sense of relief doesn't go away in chapter three when Paul talks about how God is going to uh, work that um, image of Christ into us. Right. So. And now the law isn't this heavy burden that is condemning you and weighing you down and making you feel like you can't do it. Right. Now the law is coming to you as something that you delight in. It's something that you want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, it enables us to delight in the law, to obey Christ as our head and our husband and to want to serve him and to want to be renewed in his image, which is the whole goal of salvation. You know, we might be conformed to the image of his son. Right. Romans eight twenty nine. I don't think it gets formulated that way enough. Yeah. And unfortunately, there are even some who would say, you know, I had this experience when I was um, just starting out, just graduated from seminary, doing an internship. And the pastor that I was doing an internship under was criticizing me for not doing enough application in my sermons. And so I would go back and say, okay, I'll work harder and putting even more application in my sermon. And I got to the point where I was doing more than half of the sermon was just application. Oh my goodness. But he kept coming back and, you know, that we would meet on the day, like Monday, the day after, right? After Sunday's over, we'd meet and he would go over my sermon with me. And he kept criticizing and saying, you're still not doing application. I finally realized that the reason he thought I wasn't doing application was because my applications didn't come across as this heavy convicting thing that left you feeling guilty. My applications came across as imperatives grounded in indicatives so that you wanted to do these things. (laughs) But to him, that's not application. Because true application in good Puritan style is going to make you feel guilty and weighed down with sin and make you feel convicted. Wow. (laughs) Um, Sorry. But yeah, that's how a lot of people think. Yeah. You're not really preaching the law. You're not really preaching application and imperatives unless it comes across that way. Yeah, unless it devastates you. Right. Right. And I mean, there's room for conviction, but that certainly isn't um, the diet of a healthy Christian life. Right. Okay. Um, Let's see. So we talked about Paul's uh, negative statements contrasted with his positive statements. Uh, I think uh, Colossians 2 and 3 are a fantastic illustration Mm -hmm. of that. Um. And so what I think the, the takeaway from that is what Paul is doing there and, and he does it elsewhere too, uh, really is the best gospel way to steer the course between legalism and antinomianism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that this, this way helps us to avoid legalism because it clearly, emphasizes the fact that we've been delivered from the laws of covenant of works. That's what legalism is. Legalism is any kind of teaching that somehow either by doctrine or by implication uh, gives you the impression that you're not really free from the laws of covenant of works. You're right. still under that covenant of works in some way. But I think this also, this formulation of the law in the hand of Christ also helps to avoid antinomianism by making clear that we're not free from the moral law, but we're under the moral law as it comes to us from the hand of Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9.21, right? Hmm. When he he said, uh, you know, though not being uh, without law, right? Not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. Mm Mm-hmm. 
I'm not lawless. I'm not free from the law. I'm under the law, but I'm under the law of Christ. And so that's, that's not antinomianism. We must obey Christ. He is our Lord. He has, bought, he has purchased us with his blood. And so we have an obligation to obey him and to serve him. But we do it out of love, out of response to his grace, not as a covenant of works to avoid being condemned or to somehow earn God's favor. Amen. And it seems like um, more than one of Paul's meganoitas, his may it never be, um, is uh, when he is recoiling at the idea of antinomianism. Right. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that you can just live however you want as if God and his character don't matter. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. not what I'm saying at all. It is, it is still God's law, a reflection of his character that leaves us uh, able to delight in, in the law. Mm-hmm. Because we're married to Christ. We're married to another husband. That's right. Okay. So um, hopefully as you've been hearing this, you're hearing some, uh, some early 17th and 18th century anticipations of Klein's theology. Um, Right. That's my whole intent of (laughs) of bringing this up. (laughs) Right. Um, I know that I was certainly struck as I read uh, The Marrow of Modern Divinity that I thought, wow, I think, uh, I think Klein would, would really agree with that. You know, mm-hmm. Or alternatively, if Edward had been in class with me, I think he would have been very excited too. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Yeah, and as far as I know, I'd, I'm not aware of, of um, any evidence that Klein knew much about this whole tradition. I don't think so. At least I never heard him talk about it. Yeah. He never mentioned anything about Edward Fisher or the marrow or Thomas Boston or any of these things. But I think it's great to see that within our reform tradition, we do have this vein, you know, we're right. looking for this vein that we can tap into and say, aha, there's something here. And, you know, Klein was not just making this up uh, out of thin air. There's, he's hitting on something that's biblical. And of course, the reason why, both Klein and Edward Fisher were able to think these thoughts is because they're both looking at scripture. They're both looking at, especially Paul Mm. and and his um, clear teaching on law and gospel. And it, it really does seem to go back so much to how someone understands the Mosaic covenant. Yeah, it Um, really does. And that's why I brought up republication at the beginning because right. that's that's the important background behind all of this. Um, one of the things that was so near and dear to Klein that I mean it just came out of his pores. He didn't even have to really think about talking about it. Was the the clear contrast between law and gospel, right? And I don't know how to do that faithfully or consistently unless you understand the Sinai covenant as a a typological covenant of works. I agree with you. And uh, Paul's law gospel contrast is so clear. And that's where, where Klein got it from. I mean, you know, Galatians 424, these are two covenants, Mm -hmm. which two covenants is pretty explicit. You know, there's the covenant that God made with Abraham, which is the covenant of grace. And there's the covenant that God made, at Mount Sinai, which he says, Paul says, is a covenant that genders to bondage. So these are two covenants. It's very clear. There is a law gospel contrast there. And, you know, Second Corinthians 3 as well. Um, the ministry of condemnation is contrasted with the ministry of justification in life. But I think it's helpful to just make a brief point here and say that not all law gospel contrasts are the same. Because there are others who also speak of a law gospel contrast, but they don't do it quite in the same way that Klein does or that Paul does or that the Marrow does. I'm thinking of the Lutheran approach uh, where, you know, Luther would basically say, just go through your Bible and anytime you see a, a promise, you know, that's gospel. Anytime you see God saying, you know, I'll forgive you, I'll love you, I'm going to be gracious to you, that's the gospel. But then anytime you see a command and telling you that you need to obey, that's the law. And I don't think that's quite 
consistent with with Klein or with Paul. Mm. I think that that uh, a better way to do it is to view the law gospel contrast in covenantal terms as the covenant of works in which obedience is done for life versus a covenant of grace in which obedience is done from life. True. Even having said that, I don't think we would look at um, even the helpful examples that we've seen, for example, in Colossians 3, and say that you know the imperatives there are gospel. We're still distinguishing right. between them, but we're just recognizing that right. those imperatives now come to us in a way just um, night and day different than they came to Israel. Right. So I would agree that the imperatives are not the gospel. Mm-hmm. The gospel is is that Christ died for our sins and rose again for our justification. Right. But those imperatives are not law either. I don't view those as being the law. If you're talking about this law gospel contrast, I don't think that the imperatives would be classified as the law. Got it. The way a Lutheran would. A Lutheran would say, well, there's a command there, so that must be the law. That's the part that's condemning you. That's the part that's driving you to Christ and showing you your inability. I don't think that's quite right either. So, Right, because that's not, I mean, Paul's not using the imperative in that way in, in that passage, right? Right. I think he's, he's, he's talking about the covenant of grace, and he's already explained what the gospel is, as we mentioned in, in chapter 2. But now he's giving us the imperatives that flow from the gospel. And so he's continuing to describe the covenant of grace, which is distinct from the covenant of works. Mm-hmm. So the real contrast is not commands versus promises. The real contrast is the covenant of works versus the covenant of grace. Right. Okay. So is your what you're saying about the Lutheran understanding of the law gospel contrast then that when they say law, they're always in that covenant mm-hmm. of works mode. Right. And, but then they find any command and they say that's covenant of works. Exactly. So <laughs> law is always covenant of works style. Right. Okay. And they equate commands with covenant of works. Right. Right. But then that removes this whole category of the law of Christ. Mm-hmm. So I would want to say, and I think Klein would agree, that um, both covenants, whether it's a covenant of works or a covenant of grace, have stipulations and commands. But the stipulations and the commands and the obedience function differently in each covenant. In a covenant of works, obedience is the legal basis for receiving the blessings. In a covenant of grace, obedience is the fruit of of the faith of those who have already received the blessings that have been earned by the substitute, by the mediator. That's right. So there's obedience in both, but radically different understandings of how that obedience functions within that covenant. Yeah. And in the tale of two Adams, I, I talk about that in terms of cause and effect. Right. And, and that it's just completely turned on its head in the covenant of works. Uh, someone's obedience is the cause and uh, the reward is the effect. Right. In the covenant of grace, uh, what Christ has done for us is the cause and our obedience is the effect of what he has done. Absolutely, because our obedience is actually one of the things that he has earned. Exactly. (laughs) Through his obedience, he has earned a people who are going to be progressively sanctified and ultimately glorified. So I think that this whole concept of the law in the hand of Christ fits in very well with Klein's understanding of the law gospel contrast in covenantal terms. Right. And being able to understand the concept that obedience within the framework of a covenant of grace is the fruit of faith and it's the result of receiving the blessings. It's not the cause, as you put it. Amen. And, and Klein has a whole section in Kingdom Prologue where he deals explicitly with this issue of the contrast between these two different ways in which obedience can function, whether it's in a covenant of works or in a covenant of grace. Where is that? 
Let me pull out Kingdom Prologue real quick here. It's in the chapter on the Abrahamic Covenant. So that would be Kingdom Prologue has two major parts. So it's in part two and chapter three, which the chapter itself begins on page 292, but he gets into the details of the nature of obedience beginning on page 309, where he talks about sovereign grace and human obligation. And on page 318, where he talks about the compatibility of promise and obligation. So actually, I think the, the key section is 318 to 320. Okay, good. I'd just like this, to... Yeah. I'd like to put he that says, in the show notes. Yeah, he says, distinguishing the two varieties of conditionality. <laughs> right. The covenant of works variety and the covenant of grace variety. Preach it, Meredith. All right, so that treats um, Klein's helpful emphasis on the law gospel contrast. How else does um, the marrow relate to to what Klein has done? Yeah, so I see uh, an organic connection here between. Uh, the Marrow tradition and Klein on uh, not only this issue of the law gospel contrast, but also in the way in which both the Marrow tradition and Klein emphasize that Christ is the Lord of the church, that he is the ascended Lord. I mean, just think of, you know, Matthew twenty eight eighteen: all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me, you know, and then he says, therefore go, uh, make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So Christ as the ascended Lord is the lawgiver of the church. And uh, this is something that Klein is very clear on. He talks about, you know, with his whole uh, emphasis on the ancient or Eastern treaties, right? And he speaks of the old covenant, the old Testament as being the treaty between Yahweh and Israel and the New Testament, the New Covenant, is the treaty between Christ and his church. And so Christ is now filling that slot of the suzerain. We're the vassals, and Christ is the suzerain. He's the Lord. Hmm. And so you see this, for example, in Structure of Biblical Authority. He says, page 71, the New Testament is the word of the ascended Lord of the New Covenant. Right. I can see that fitting hand in glove with uh, this idea of the, the law in the hand of Christ. Right. And he often talks about, you know, he looks at Revelation 1 through 3, where you have that vision of the ascended Lord, you know, in his awesome power and glory, mm. his divine glory. And he's walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands and he's, you know, exhorting his people and calling them to obedience and even threatening them with removal of their lampstand if they are not faithful to the covenant. And, uh, you know, you have another um, passage that Klein likes to use is Hebrews 3. We mentioned this in a few episodes back, mm -hmm. um, that whole house building metaphor, you know, and he compares Moses with Jesus, the author of Hebrews does. He says, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. So here's the idea of the church being a house, and it's both the the building house and the people house. And but you know that's what Moses Moses was the was the servant over that house in the old covenant, and Christ is the not the servant but the son who is the the uh, the Lord over the house of God mm. in the new covenant. And uh, Klein will even speaking of this parallel between the two suzerain treaties, the old covenant and the new, he'll, he'll even speak of Christ as Yahweh Christ with mm. a dash. Uh, <laughs> that's in page 88 of structure. He says the Lordship of Yahweh Christ. So I think that's a kind of a cool little way of showing the parallel with, um, the suzerain and the old covenant. Right. So, you know, and then just to tie this back to some of the marrow uh, language, John Gill, for example, will 
say something that sounds almost like like Klein. You know, Klein talks about these two different polities. There's the Mosaic and the Messianic, and the Old Covenant is the canon of the Mosaic polity, and the New Testament is the polity or constitution of the Messianic. Well, John Gill says pretty much the same thing. He says, Christ is king and lawgiver in his house and kingdom, the church. And besides some positive commands, which he has delivered out, there is a repetition of the law in the New Testament, a new edition of it, published under the authority and sanction of Christ, so that we are now under the law to him and under new obligations to obey it as held forth by him. Hmm. I like that. Yeah, I thought that was a helpful, helpful quote. And, uh, you know, again, showing this idea of the New Testament being the law of Christ and Christ is the lawgiver over his house. And so we are under the authority of Christ. We're bound to obey him. Well, that's very good and helpful and encouraging. Um, anything else that you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, I think the main thing would be to encourage people to get a hold of the marrow of modern divinity and to take a look at it. Yes. Um, and we will link to, um, a, a Google books version of it so that you can at least have that. But, uh, the Christian focus, uh, copy is very reasonable. I'd encourage our, our listeners to get uh, a hold of that. We'll uh, link to that in the show notes as well. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Lee. I appreciated that. All right, everyone. Um, hope you enjoyed the episode this week. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Thoughts, comments. Um, you can email us at glorycloudpodcast at gmail.com and tweet us at glorycloudpod. And we'll see you next week.